So Ryzen has finally landed, and for those of you who have only a passing interest in technology or simply look at cold hard graphs, then it can be quite confusing to decipher if it's actually any good. And I'm sure you've seen multiple websites which seem to paint a picture of failure, of disappointment amongst buyers, and yet another mishit from AMD. So what's actually going on? While at the moment it is true that the R7 lineup does fall short of Intel's top line CPUs in some games at 1080p when using something like a Titan Pascal or one of the higher 10 series cards from Nvidia, but what about if you're just a normal gamer? Well first we need to take a look and kind of decide what an average gaming rig looks like today, and to do this we're going to be taking a look at the Steam hardware survey and comparing it to the budget gaming rig that we do most of our tests on on here. So having a look at it, 4 cores, yup with that we're already in the upper majority, 8GB of RAM, again we're in the upper majority here, and the GPU, well the humble little 1050 Ti that just happens to be installed at the moment, we're kinda in the mixer there too. So looking at the budget gaming rig and sourcing a CPU on eBay, we can get a package spec'd up to the same spec for about £270, but if used is not your thing then equivalent KB Lake i5, something like a 7400 or 7500 will probably be in the same ballpark performance wise as our budget system, and that will come in at about £340 new. My Ryzen R7 1700 system, it comes in about 465 so it costs a cool £125 more than that KB Lake system I just spec'd up, but according to a lot of outlets, it's going to be hampered by bad gaming performance at 1080p. But since we've already established that our budget gaming system here, it's at least on par with what the majority of gamers are using today, let's see how the 1700 compares and see if you're actually getting anything more for your money gaming wise. On top of that, this test is going to try and make it as hard as it possibly can be for the R7-1700. We're going to be using an out of box configuration for the Ryzen CPU. This means no overclocking, no extended clocks in the memory, which is also limiting the memory to 2133MHz until new BIOS updates come out. And all done on a stock 1050Ti. We're also going to be ignoring any other workaround techniques that AMD have been advising for performance. This means that SMT, AMD's version of Intel's hyperthreading, will remain on regardless of what individual games prefer. And finally, it's a fresh install of Windows 10 with no tweaking and the power options, nothing. So in short, this is going to be the absolute worst case scenario for our R7-1700. To make matters worse, we're going to run it up against the heavily optimised old faithful test setup of the Core i5-4590, which is going to have all four cores locked at 3.7GHz, 8GB of Corsair DDR3 RAM, and will of course be benchmarking both at the same 1920x1080 resolution and at the same graphical settings. So kicking things off today, we've got the Hitman benchmarking tool. Now the i5 test rig returns an average frame rate of 66fps. Now we don't use the minimum figures return on this benchmark, simply because compared to the actual gameplay experience it's not a good indication of the lows. The average though is within acceptable margins of what you're going to get in game. The Ryzen build manages to surpass the i5 build with a very impressive average frame rate of 79 FPS which is 20% more. Our run through in Crisis 3 comprised of the first two chapters with fraps recording the frame rate throughout. In this run through the core i5 returned an average of 63 and a minimum of 45 which is very close to my previous run throughs in this configuration. The Ryzen system manages to topple both averages and minimums with an average of 69, which is 10% higher, and a minimum of 54. While this increase on the average was nothing really to shout home about, a 20% increase in minimums did make the game feel much smoother to play than on the Intel build. And it was a similar story in Far Cry Primal. The Core i5 build returned an average frame rate of 37 FPS, with the minimums just below 30. This of course was with the HD texture pack turned on and the ultra settings. The Ryzen build managed to rise above this by 4 FPS or 11% on the average, and an increase of 4 FPS or 14% on the minimums. GTA 5 now, and this is a game that the Ryzen CPU line has been criticised heavily against higher end Intel chips. So how about a mid-range Intel setup? Well, the Intel rig returned us figures of 70 FPS on average and 40 for the minimums. And the R7 1700 once again clawed further ahead with scores of 87 FPS on average and 52 on minimum. Now that is 24% and 30% increase respectively. Jumped into an older game now and we're going to use the intense Metro Last Light 
Redux benchmark. And this was interesting because this is one benchmark that I run that the R7-1700 actually fell short of the 4590 by about 18% on average, with averages of 56 compared with 68 and minimums of 33 compared with 39. Finally, we spent some time in the single player portion of Battlefield 1. Now, the Intel system managed to return 62 FPS on average and 52 in the minimum. This was on the Ultra preset and running through the same mission on the 1700, we returned an average frame rate of 59 FPS, which is 5% lower than on the Intel system. The minimums, however, were a smidge higher at 55 FPS. So where does this leave the Ryzen R7? Well, compared to my 4590 test setup, and even in this really crippled state, it is faster when coupled with the same mid-range GPU, which for me is good. I mean, I opted to open my wallet for AMD, so it's nice to see a little boost even in this infant state. And that's kind of the main point here. The AM4 platform, it's in its infancy. It's plagued with BIOS problems, limiting its functionality. I mean, I've already touched on the fact my memory is only running at about two-thirds speed. And these teething issues are compounded by the fact that games have not just been optimised for Intel lately, but they've been designed on Intel platforms for like the last half decade. And the fact that Ryzen comes out of the gates and performs as it does is actually pretty staggering to me. At the moment there seems to be an almost daily slew of updates pumping in my Ethernet port, each one enhancing the experience on the platform, and it's a strange feeling for me as I usually end up with a product that's well established and used. Ryzen sets a good baseline that's getting better every single day, and compared to AMD's previous offerings it's a quantum leap forward, and compared to what the majority of PC gamers are using, the R7 is also going to be a step up for them too. I mean, I've just focused on the gaming performance in this video rather than the workstation tax that this particular PC is going to be spending the majority of its time doing. But just let me finish by saying that even if you just delve into things like CAD, video rendering, computational analysis, or complex engineering calculations, the R7700 is going to be the most effective way to get blistering performance. In these scenarios, nothing touches it for the money. So am I glad I bought a ticket for the hype train? Absolutely. It's not as all eclipsing as the brochure shred. I mean, the carriage has got a few rough edges and the concierge forgot my ice for my G&T, but now I'm nestled in the seat, there's actually nowhere I'd rather be, and I'm sure by the end of this journey, AMD will have nailed all these niggles down. But folks, that's it for me. Thanks for taking the time to have a look at this Ryzen R7-1700. Use those thumbs and leave me a comment down below to tell me what you think of it, and stick around for more content, and I'll catch you soon.